Welcome to the Long Range Pursuit Podcast, presented by Gunworks, where we learn about and share long-range shooting techniques, science, and gear. All right, welcome to uh, another episode of Long Range Pursuit Podcast. This is an Instructor's Corner podcast and our episode, and this one's called uh, Practice Makes You a Little Better, because it doesn't make you perfect, it makes you a little better, um, but really we're addressing how people train and you know, how can you become a better shooter versus kind of just sustaining or, you know, going out on your hunt and being pretty, you're not on top of your stuff anymore. So, um, long range setting, when guys talk about going to the range and, you know, shooting long range, getting the gun set up, um, a lot of guys are thinking, including myself, the picture I, I, or the, what I picture is shooting off a bench, a covered awning, shooting yard lines, and maybe you're collecting data and, you know, you can get a lot from collecting data like that, but you know, what else is there? What else is there? What can you do at the range rather than just sit on a bench and shoot yard lines and write down dopes? You know, I think a lot of it is, you know, first off, most people don't really have the opportunity to shoot at a lot of distance where they get the opportunity to work in wind and stuff, you know, so when they get that opportunity, you know, that's when you want to be working on reading wind, reading mirage, wind calls, you know, hopefully their data is already locked on. You know, but kind of take advantage of those opportunities to shoot distance and shoot in the wind as opposed to going to the range and working on marksmanship. Yeah, you, know, you can do that on the 100-yard range. Sure, yeah. So it's 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 like marksmanship and ballistic data are kind of your baseline. Yeah, two different, but two different range days, really. Sure, sure. So it can be. And, but then another range day then is now you're getting into your wind and more specific scenarios or tripod shooting or any of that stuff, right? Yeah, but but you got your marksmanship down for like a good zero, and you're mm-hmm. shooting good and truing, and then you're checking your data on different ranges, yard lines or whatever, and then and then where were you going with that? You're saying, you know, I kind of think the main thing is just like you know when you go to the range, like go with a plan. Sure, okay. yeah, you know, don't just go like ah, I'm going to shoot a little bit, yeah, you know, and then you get there, you shoot a little bit, you don't really accomplish anything. But if you kind of go with a plan, yeah, you know, and you're like, all right, but let, let's say all I've got is a hundred yard range. You know, so I can't do long range ballistics, but I can work on marksmanship. You know, so I go there first off any training day, cold bore, confirm zero. Yeah, you know, we want to do that from the most stable position possible because we're trying to test the equipment, not us. Mm-hmm. You know, we only get one chance a day to shoot a cold bore shot, so make it a good one. And then, uh, you know, once you do that, it's like okay, I'm going to shoot a couple groups. I'm going to work on my bench technique or my prone technique, whatever. Yeah, you know, but then bring your tripod, you know, and do some dry firing off the tripod. And then shoot a couple groups off the tripod. And then do some two-shot drills off the tripod where you break everything down, build your position, fire two shots, break it all down again. Sure. Yeah, you know, and you know, do the same thing over and over again, you know, until you get better at actually the mechanics, kind of like the equipment or the um what do we call it, uh Oh, like your system readiness type stuff. Are you talking about our equipment readiness day? No, I was talking about uh and we Brain, yeah, I know, I'm brain farting the word here. <laughs> it's uh, your equipment management. Working oh, on your equipment management, like with your tripod and your rear rear supports and stuff like that. You know, because I think the more often you set up that position and you strive to get it set up perfectly, then the more likely you are to set it up pretty close to perfect in the field. Sure. You know, because under a little bit of stress, I think you're going to set up that position and you're pretty much going to go with wherever you end up. You know, so if you've been practicing it, you'll probably land pretty close to perfect or pretty close to the right position. But if you haven't been practicing it, the height's probably going to be wrong. The tripod height's going to be wrong. Something's going to be wrong, but you're just going to make it work because of the pressure. Yeah. And absolutely. I think knowing your equipment is huge. And I mean, just that scenario right there, we see guys get set up and, and we're going into a rabbit hole here real quick. I'll try and bounce back out. But when you're talking tripods, you know, when you get set up, uh, guys who come to class and they set up their tripod and, you know, they set it up to what they think is perfect and then they sit down and it's too high because they're yeah. not thinking about the scope height over yeah. the And then, uh, you know, you're setting up on a hill and they set up the tripod as if we're sitting on a flat surface yeah. and they get in and it's all wobbly. And so it's just putting yourself in these different scenarios to where, yeah, when it, the time comes, you already have done it a couple of times. Yep. Um, but I want to back to the, back up to the first thing you said, which was checking the cold bore. Um, again, that can be its own or shooting a a, a cold bore that can be its own rabbit hole. But I think people are going to hear that right away and they're going to be like, well, you know, my cold bore is not within my group. Like what, what can I do? Or, 
you know, I don't check cold bore that often. It's not that big a deal, et cetera, that kind of stuff. You know, they're going to hear that right when we start talking. Let's talk about cold bore real quick. What, what can you do? Let's say you do have a cold bore that's not in your group and average Joe's coming to the range. And cause we see that quite a bit at class, you know, they bring in a, a, a personal rifle of theirs or something. And, um, they're like, Hey, my cold war isn't within the group. And then what do we do to, to help them with that? Or what's our suggestion? Hmm. What would be your uh, suggestion? I approach it a little bit differently than you guys do. Um, you know, you guys coming from the sniper community, you know, checking your cold bore, you did that quite often. Um, uh, I, I run a little process when I first get a firearm about a week to a week and a half straight every other day or every couple of days, I'm checking a cold bore. And then once I eliminate that as a variable, what that allows me to do is then that puts it back onto my fundamentals. So to, to your question, a customer comes to the range. We, we already know the gun performs well, and we've already done our cold bore testing to make sure we don't have the problem. So I, I show up at the range, I check my zero really quick and first shot goes somewhere it it wasn't supposed to right a cold bore or something happened that first now i can eliminate half the the equation i know it's not the firearm so now i can directly look back into what am i doing right and you know what are some big ones rear bag you know too fluffy or too stiff you know there's a lot of little things technique wise and so i approach it just a little bit differently like i i tend to do the testing beforehand and then i'm I believe, right? It's like, then I don't come back to it. Yeah. But if I see something weird, mm -hmm. that allows me to say, okay, well, I've already done that testing, so I don't need to come back to, to this. Yeah. Does that make sense yeah. to you guys? No, good point. Like, you guys come from a background of, man, you guys are, like, always testing that cold bore, point of impact shift. You know, I've, I've never really, you know, because we put so much time in the front end of what we did testing, mm -hmm. that I just have become... I don't know what the right word is. Like you, you Complacent, <laughs> maybe. You trust it. I, yeah. I trust it to some degree, right? Like that it's going to be there. Once I've done the testing, you know, and I know that, you know, for a week and a half straight, in whether it was cold or warm or upside down or sideways, that bullet hit right where I wanted it to at my 100 yard, you know, from a nice fixed position. That would be my bench work, right? Yeah. That's before we get into the, the yeah. field shooting. So then when I do get into that, you know, practicing at the range, <clears throat> after I've confirmed data and my zero and all those other things, then then I know it's me. And so then I can directly address that and fix it much quicker, I think. Sure. And so I, I, I come at it just a little bit differently than you guys. You guys find the problem that day or whatever, maybe, you know, and then, and then you do the same thing I do after that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, I, that's a good point though. I, that it's interesting. It's always fun talking to Jeremy and seeing the way he does things. He's very yeah. meticulous. Yeah. <laughs> We're just, you know, thugs on a gun. Well, you might be a little more meticulous yeah. in your testing because you're yeah. testing it every time. I'm just... Yeah. I'm believing that it's, that it's working. Right. And then it has for years and years, you know, we, you know, we put those policies in place and we tested that stuff and it worked very well for us. Um, I've seen very, very few failures when it comes to that. So, so you know, I think, yeah, yeah. I think maybe one thing is to back up a little bit and talk about really the two things that can affect your cold bore. You know, with one being a change in the bore condition from the last time you zeroed the rifle and number two being some sort of mechanical shift that takes place either in the barrel joint or between the stock and the action that would just come from rough handling and abuse. Yeah. Yeah, because those are kind of two separate things. Yeah, 100%. And what Jeremy's talking about is pretty much with your bore condition. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, so it's number one, leaving the rifle a little bit dirty, or yep. seasoned as we like to call it. And then, actually, I think another important one that I learned from Jeremy is what he brings up all the time in the cleaning class is about sealing that barrel. Yeah, you want to dive into that? Yeah, without getting into it too much and pull oh, us off track here. <laughs> Um, you know, the, the bore condition plays such a huge role in that first shot. Cause we know that the second, third and fourth coming out of that gun are dry because you had all this pressure and fire down there. You know, we've burnt out any residual, you know, and any moisture in there on that first round acts like a lubricant and the easier your bullet has, the easier time it has to travel down that bore, um, the less pressure is created and the lower the velocity is. So you'll notice usually when you have a bore condition problem because of moisture, or oil, or whatever, that first shot will drop velocity-wise low. And we track it out in our class. We have a little demonstration with the guys. And, and it tracks low every time. So we know, we know that it's going to be low. So we need to keep that dry condition as dry as possible. So when I'm done shooting at the range, the first thing I do is I tape the end of my barrel. Right? And, and I think a lot of us have done that throughout the years, but we're forgetting half the equation, right? We're forgetting the chamber end. You know, when you close a bolt and close that action, that bolt does not seal that chamber. You know, it takes a cartridge. So 
what I do is I take a, a once fired um, case because it's fire formed to the chamber and it actually seals pretty well. And I'll take a Sharpie or whatever and, and color that once fired cartridge so that I know that it's my my dummy round or my, you know, my chamber plug. So I'm not mistaken a fire ground for it. And then I close that in the chamber before I leave. And so what I'm doing is I'm trapping in that hot, dry, those hot, dry gases in the, in the barrel so that when I do come back to the range, that there's just a, a, a moment of time when I open the bolt and eject that dummy round and I, I put the new cartridge in to fire, that there's just a small amount of time that I actually can get some moisture in that barrel. And so that helps me by, I've been doing that for a long time and, and it's made my point of impact shift or my, my cold bore shift from a bore condition standpoint, almost perfect. I hardly ever see those, sh you know, point of impact shifts anymore from that bore condition since I've started trapping in that, you know, that hot dry air. Yeah. You know, and I've been doing this since like 1988 <laughs> and I had never heard of that before until yeah. I came here. Yeah. And as soon as Jeremy told me that, it was like the little bing, <laughs> little light went on. I'm like, we are missing half the equation there. Yeah. And genius. I think that's, you know, one of the important things. And, you know, cause we all know that a clean cold bore is probably not going to be on target. But when you're trying to identify why a dirty cold bore shot, you yeah. know, from a foul barrel or a seasoned barrel, why that shot's not on target, I think that's, you know, three quarters of it right there. Yeah, you know, it, it comes from, you know, a lot a lot of our owner, Aaron, right? You know, very engineer-minded. Um, you know, he's all about eliminating things from the process so that when we do have problems, we have very few things we need to look at. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So. We, by doing that, we can eliminate bore condition out of that flyer yep. that we see. And so then the second part of that becomes, you know, well, okay, the mechanical side, right? So now we've got this mechanical side that doesn't function somewhere in there. And we just need to figure it out whether it's a loose screw, you know, in our, in our case, like on our actions, the wedge is loose, you know, where we don't have a bedding or something like that, where the wedge comes loose, it allows it to relax forward. You know, there's a myriad of things that can happen there, but, you know, pretty easy to run through yeah. with the torques and check everything really quick. And then, and if it's not that, then it's 100% you. Yeah. <laughs> no, no question about it. You know, you've, you've, you've crossed the rifle off the list at that point. Right. It's now a fundamentals problem. Right. Yeah. We track cold bores literally, you know, first thing we did every training day, you know, was track a cold bore shot. You know, and basically our minimal training cycle is like once a month. You know, but even like once a month is that's too long. You know, because you go a month without shooting, you're feeling pretty rusty. And just the simple act of telling everybody, hey, before you shoot your cold bore shot, I want you to dry fire about ten times. Just work on your technique and dry fire, and just kind of get into that zone. And that alone, I think, tightens up cold bores because, like Jeremy was saying, when it's not mechanical and it's not the bore, it's something you're doing. Sure. And even just getting a couple repetitions, well, we're shooting better a couple shots later. But that one that we are trying to track, that was our first one, which is probably our worst shot, you know, and that dry fire and really kind of tightens that up. Mm, sure. Well, I, I said, let's not dive too deep, but let's dive deep. I, so let's back it up again, though, and say, you know, you're you're doing that correctly here. You're sealing both ends. But let's say you, you know, you don't have a gunworks rifle or you don't have a bedded rifle and or a bedded action and you're just, You've got someone else's gun and, and you're shooting and you do have cold bore issues. Like, what can you do to fix that? Because I think there's going to be people that are like, well, sweet, everyone talks about cold bore and you got to track them, but what the heck do I do? You know, well, I think like, a lot okay, of... The seal in is one, maybe dry fire is another, but what about the mechanical thing? You know, on the gun? mechanical side, I think it's taking care of the rifle. Mm -hmm. You know, I think everybody likes to look at the scope. And if you look at most of your major scope manufacturers, the amount of impact testing and the stuff they do with scopes, they're pretty tough. Yeah. You know, but... Imagine you're stalking along, and I am have my rifle in my hand, and I am crawling, and as I'm doing so, I'm putting weight on my rifle. Okay, well, what am I doing? I probably got support under the stock and support under the barrel somewhere, so I'm putting weight, trying to basically bend that action in the stock. Mm -hmm. And then you take a shot, and sure enough, that shot is a couple minutes right or left. Well, that was just because of the way you just handled that rifle in the stocking process. You know, so I think a lot of it just comes down to being aware and thinking about it, and, you know, same thing as a rifle strapped to a backpack. If you're just dragging that rifle through tree limbs, and every time you hit a tree limb, that barrel's getting whacked, you know, and it's that, that torque there, that impact's getting put onto the, that bedding system. You know, if you, if you know that's a problem and you think about the way you handle a rifle, I think it's much less likely to be a problem for you in the field. Yeah, you want, you want tough stuff when you're yeah. out hunting, uh, you know, 
backcountry stuff and you're on horses and you're sitting down with your pack and whatnot, but you still do need to treat your rifle like yeah. a baby. Yeah. 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 What, Jerry? What do you got? I don't treat my rifle yeah. very well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, uh, you know, on the mechanical side, the the big fix is bedding, right? Obviously, if you haven't bedded your rifle, you know, it. it there's the two screws do not hold it very well, even with a V-block you know, in a round style action that, that mates itself quite well, you know, the screws pull it to a center point. There can still be some shifting in there as, you know, shot to shot because the screw holes in the, in the, uh, the stock and your bedding block and whatnot are larger than the, you know, the screws that you're using. Mm -hmm. and, and so there is some room for movement in there. Right. And so you, you're just, if you are getting that first shot flyer, what's happening is, is that, that, uh, action is relaxing in the stock when you put it away and you come back out and that first shot is essentially seating that um, recoil lug back into position. And then everything shoots really good from there until you put it away again and it relaxes back into that neutral position again and then the first shot back too. And and so guys have a, a hard time with that because they're chasing that first shot. And obviously the first shot's the most important shot on the hunting side. And so what we're trying to do is eliminate that. And the, the best way to do that uh, on a rifle that doesn't have a wedge or some way to put constant pressure on the recoil lug is to bed the rifle. You know, and you've probably seen me back there, you know, throwing some of that Marine techs in there, you know, and bedding, bedding up some of my, you know, rifles that don't have the wedge. Um, you know, it works really well. Um, it still leaves a little bit of room in there because you have to be able to pull it apart. So you put some release agent. There's still just a little bit of room in there. I like the wedge better. Um, but it, it can eliminate a huge flyer and maybe it puts that flyer still within what you considered acceptable. You know, it might be a quarter or half, half minute out. But that's still within the three quarter minute or whatever the the accuracy of the gun is, and so it, it should work, you know, at that point. So yeah, we well, you know the other thing to say about Jeremy is I'm pretty sure he's never had a barrel hit a tree limb because I don't think he owns a barrel longer than 18 inches. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> nope, I don't. <laughs> okay, so that barrel's just like right here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, let's we'll back out again. I uh, bedding and cold bores and all this stuff is its own episode yeah. and i would yeah. like to do one like that because it'd be yeah. I, I would learn i actually think we hit it pretty good though yeah, yeah yeah um bedding though i i've never bedded my own rifle and both of you guys obviously have done multiple and they keep telling me hey just bring your rifle out and we'll we'll mess with one you know and i i just haven't done that yet so. yeah worst case scenario it just becomes permanent you're right uh, you know stock becomes permanent to the rifle right and actually we problem solved about yeah. that <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay well let's back it out again um how about uh, scenarios? What Like for, again, at the range, what are some, you know, again, we, we kind of talked about you got to have, you had to have done it once um, to where it becomes, or a couple times, hopefully, to where it becomes uh, natural out in the field to do it. So like, what are some drills that you can do? I know you talked about like zeroing at the range and doing a couple drills on the, on the uh, tripod, but what are some other things that we could do? Yeah, I think you just, uh, you know, Figure out what what a reasonable amount of time is that you can realistically set up a good position in that reasonable amount of time that's not so rushed that you make a bad position work mm -hmm. and start a stopwatch. You know, you've got two minutes to set up this supported seating position with everything collapsed and then get two hits on target. Yeah. You know, and put it on a stopwatch so it has a little pressure. And then the other thing I would say is, you know, run a video. You know, because you'll probably see that you've got a lot of wasted movement. You know, the guys in like the PRS world are really good at this, where they run video and they they look at everything they do and they realize that hey, I'm losing five seconds by the way I pull out my tripod legs. Yep. And in their world, that's five more seconds that can be spent firing a good shot. Yeah. And you know, so you know, run a stopwatch and video it. Yeah. Sure. Anything, Jeremy? Uh, I I would say that we're just very spoiled in the department of having access to do all this kind of stuff, and so. For you guys out there, you know, I know, I know a lot of guys don't have access, like we were talking about earlier, to to distance. But most ranges have one or two or three hundred yards that you could go to. And so my recommendation when it comes to the training side is get a twenty-two trainer, right? A twenty-two rifle, twenty-two rimfire. Put a sc a turreted scope on it. Shoot your data. Get you you know some drop data. Uh, a twenty-two from twenty-five to three hundred is just like shooting a Creedmoor or, or a regular rifle from zero to a thousand. Your your wind dopes are very similar at a th you know a thousand and three hundred. You know, when you, when you talk about that. And so, you know, for the guys that don't have access to that, you know, and you hear us, you know, talking about, you know, all the privileges we get, I guess I could say, you know, we, we have access to be able to, to train and, and, and do all those kind of things. I think if you just took a step back, uh, you know, a, a 22 trainer, 
zero to 25 and then dial it just like you range dial and shoot just like you would your your standard platform you'll still see the same accuracy problems show up from fundamentals um you know you'll see all those same things and uh, sometimes even a little more magnified um, because of the the re reduction in recoil, you might see more gun movement or things, you know, with your trigger pull and some things like that, where the gun doesn't move as much under recoil. And so I think it just gives guys that don't have access to, you know, public land or whatever, you know, a chance to go to a, just a regular range and put in some serious time behind the gun, you know, no. and then cost, right? No. Yeah. I think that's key is, is just more time behind the gun. Yeah, it's, it really is. That You, you talk about like uh, in some of our... Um, uh, shoot what's it called why am i thinking one of our classes is that we go out and we shoot off tripod a lot what the heck is that oh, the field marksmanship field marksmanship okay uh we'll do like some dummy rounds and and uh malfunction drills and stuff like that and if you shoot enough you're going to be getting those drills yeah. you're going to be getting malfunction drills and and you know things where you're you know when you close the bolt what it sounds like or feels like when there's a round that actually went in you know what to do when you hear a click or you have a you know a double feed or whatever so anyway, just more time behind the gun is, I think it's, you know, and I think, you know, to jump on board with Jeremy there, you know, what you really get out of that 22 of that low recoiling gun is you take away a lot of the negatives that people get, you know, cause there's a, you can actually make yourself a lot worse by going to the range. You know, if you take your typical 300 wind mag to the range and shoot it a lot, you're probably just getting better at flinching, you know, cause if you don't put a lot of energy into making sure that you're not flinching, you're just learning to flinch, you know, so one of the keys to learn to shoot a heavy recoil gun is don't shoot it too much and spend a lot of time on that 22 or on like your 6.5 Creedmoor or something where there's not a lot of recoil, you're not flinching because otherwise it's just going to be an ingrained habit that's really hard to defeat once you get it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we talk about dry firing quite a bit when we talk about fundamentals and stuff too and and uh, like you're talking about before your cold bore and stuff too, but um, getting your fundamentals down with the dry firing. Uh, the, what's the story on like the Olympic shooters? Oh yeah, I mean if you you know if you talk to like guys that shoot you know, Olympic shooters or guys that shoot like you know like national level Ipsic or something, you know kind of their belief. You know we're talking about pistol shooting here, but kind of their belief is that shooting live rounds is really counterproductive. Yeah, you know, so you know the example is if you shoot two hundred rounds in a match on a weekend, they'll prescribe themselves a thousand dry fires the next week, basically to undo the damage they did by shooting those live rounds. You know because. Just at a very minute basis, you're learning to flinch mm -hmm. anytime something explodes right next to your face. Mm -hmm. You know, oftentimes that flinch will just be as subtle as, you know, like blinking an eye, you know, just a, a blink. Yeah, but we always say it's like, if you blink when you shoot, that also means you jerk the trigger because how else would you know when to blink? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, your body's protecting itself. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah, and you, you get that out of your system with those 22s and by dry firing and, you know, low recoiling rounds. Sure. Okay, how about uh, how about targets? Like, what kind of targets should we be shooting or uh, practicing on? I mean, there's we there's a couple different things we do. One is lung stencils, so that we're seeing if you hit vitals or not. Um, rather than just a square plate, there's a plate that we do a stencil, so it looks like vitals. So yeah. it's a really cool visual. One, yeah. uh, but two, then you're not so sucked into did I hit the tiny dot that I spray painted on there? I'm I'm within the vitals, like those. I'm shooting well, and my gun's doing what it's supposed to do. Um, what other targets? Uh, you know, I mean, I, I mean, I think we can take a lot from the archery hunters. I mean, if you look at you look at archers and bow hunters, you know, they shoot at three D targets yeah. probably eighty percent of the time. You know, and they kind of look at a bullseye bag target as just being something that they, yeah, I, I use that when I'm zero on my bow or something like that. But, you know, when they're seriously like working on their skills, they're shooting 3D targets, you know, because with that, it's become an instinctive, like, where do I aim on different animals? Mm -hmm. You know, so I really think that that's a, and that's really something you can do at 100 yards with that 22 that Jeremy was talking about, or even closer, you know, because it's just a scaled down picture. You know, but what you're doing is you're taking your different game animals that have vitals located in different places. And make it an instinctive. Where do I shoot this animal? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, so I think that that comes back from the Marine Corps. It's like yeah. when you're shooting targets, we're not shooting paper targets that have black circles on them. It's a, it's a person. Yeah, it looks like a person. Uh, so I think that transitions over to hunting for sure. Yeah, why not? If you're going on a sheep hunt, why not practice shooting a, a picture that, of a sheep? Yeah, yeah, so that when it comes up, you've seen that picture in your scope before. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I always like the story you told about that gentleman you took down on uh, Whittington. Yeah. And that charity hunt. 
Yeah. Yeah, you know, and how how you set him up in the room to get some dry fire practice. Yeah, he was it was his first big game animal hunt ever and he was shooting a uh he had a bull elk tag um at the Whittington Center. And uh yeah, so we're like, Well, let's get you familiar with it and I just Googled a picture of a of an elk that had vitals traced on it on my laptop. I mean, we were just working with what we had at that moment yeah. and and in the cabin we set it up on one wall and set him up on uh the other side of the cabin and you know made sure there's no around in the chamber and then just he dry fired he probably dry fired for five minutes but just yeah. looking at this elk and knowing where to put that cross yeah. there and where the vitals are actually located and yeah and then he went out next day and shot one at 570 yards i think it was it's awesome yeah it was awesome yeah okay um how about uh practicing shooter spotter walk on type stuff how about that we we do some of that in in class, and I think that's its own art. Yeah, you know, especially if you get the opportunity, you know, your normal hunting buddy. You know, if like you guys go hunting together, you know, then it's really beneficial just to, you know, because if you look at what takes time and what creates the loss of an opportunity when you're hunting, oftentimes it's time. You know, by the time we get set up and by the time we find that animal who can locate that animal in the scope, the opportunity's passed. Mm -hmm. You know, so if you can become more efficient at one person that spots an animal getting his partner on it through the rifle scope, which looks different than the binos, you know, if you can do that quicker and more efficiently, you're more likely to, you know, have an opportunity before that goes away and you practice it. You don't even need to be at the range to practice that. You know, you can practice that just anytime you're out in, out in nature, you know, just, you know, verbally walking them onto a rock or verbally walking them onto a certain bush. Yeah. It's funny, you know, why is, it, it sounds goofy to have that as part of your training thing, but it really is a, it's a skill set to be yeah. able to walk someone on I, uh, my dad probably won't listen to this, but my, my dad, uh, you know, grew up shooting pheasants and, and not big game stuff. And, and he came out with just a white tail hunt that I was, and I shot this deer at like 480 or something. So that was the distance, you know, that these deer were walking across. So there was still some walking on that was taking place, but, uh, he saw the deer before I did. And he goes, they're right there. They're right there. And I said, where are they at? You know, I'm looking and he says, right by that tree. Okay. Right. Narrows it down. There's a grove out there. Which tree is it? Okay, there's a rock to the right of it. You know, and, oh man, it was frustrating. You know, yeah. Uh, so absolutely, it it is its own skill set. And some, uh, what are some ways to, what are some uh, techniques to walk people onto targets? Well, I think the big one is is everybody overpowers their optics. Yeah. Right. Like anything over twenty is probably too much. And so just just having the know how to just crank that power down when you're looking right gives you such a bigger field of view and and so there's half the battle right there so you're just not looking through that straw down range right open that field of view up you know and then uh then it's always just big landmark to smaller landmark to smaller landmark you know start huge and just work yourself down into a, essentially from a big picture to a small picture creates a v right down to the to whatever you're shooting at yeah that yeah and i think back well. to oh, i think back to the marine corps you know we use a you know from that large animal large landmark working to the smaller landmark and then once you're getting close you know we used a lot of you know a lot of you know finger width two fingers fist away mm -hmm. a lot of clock system yeah you know it's uh you know one fist away at three o'clock yeah it, it, even even using your reticle uh, if yeah. you got them close but they just can't pick it out you're looking for the antlers or something that are moving. Mm -hmm. it's like you found that rock okay he's you know, six M away to the left and two M away up, you know, yeah. and then you can usually find it. I, we've done that a couple of times at Sheep Mountain because some of those targets are pretty hard to find there. Yeah. I also think close, find something close is, is sometimes a good way to mm -hmm. do it. It's like, Hey, do you see the dandelion that's six feet in front of you? Yeah. Okay. Straight above that is the yeah. tree and then you move yeah. you know, big to small or whatever. Yeah. I really think like close or horizon line, mm -hmm. you know, something prominent either close or something on the horizon line gives you a good starting point. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, how about, uh, let's talk wind a little bit, you know, how, how can you get better at, uh, calling wind? Cause that's the next thing is, okay, well, we, we've got fundamentals down. We've done some hundred yard stuff and our fundamentals are pretty good. Our data is pretty good. We've, you know, checked out on different yard lines and maybe we're doing some scenario type stuff, but wind is always the, the big factor. So what can we do to get better at wind? Well, I think the first thing is just go out and shoot in it, right? It's like n nobody goes to the range shooting when it's crappy windy, right? Like, and so we we never learn because we never are in that situation, right? So, to me, 
as, as soon as you've got data and verified data and you know your data is good and you've got a good zero, then you should never go to the range, in my opinion, again, unless something catastrophic happens with the rifle. And I re need to recheck that stuff. Never go to the range again. In, uh, yeah, on a nice day. Nice day yeah, yeah. Yep. Yep. You should go on nasty days. Number one, you'll have the range to yourself because right. nobody else will be out there. I guarantee it. And number two, it, it's going to be more field ready, right? Like that when when you're out hunting the the good days definitely don't outnumber the bad days usually mm -hmm. it's usually windy and especially wyoming it's usually windy or it's cloudy or something right and so going out on the range on those crappy days and actually getting some time in even though it doesn't look like you're shooting that well down there because you're not maybe you're not dinging that steel in the center every time it is better for you in the long run you know learning wise to have that you know experience in shooting in the wind under your belt and then maybe don't make changes off of some little tiny things that you're seeing because it could just be that. Yeah, we, we make no changes once oh, we verified, right? Yeah. We yeah. trust. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. That's we right. Believe. <laughs> <laughs> you got anything on that, Brian? No, I think the other thing too is just have a wind meter. Yeah. Yeah. You know, because if you have a wind meter on you, and I'm not talking just when you're at the range training, you know, it's like you think back to sniper school. You know, was, I didn't have wind meters at sniper school, but Ian did. <laughs> you know, and they literally carried them everywhere, you know, and- you stand there and you face into the wind and you say in your mind, you're like, okay, I think this is seven or eight miles per hour. Let me check. You know, and you do that for a while and you get so much better at just gauging that wind speed based on what you're feeling on your face or on your skin. You know, you get so much better at getting a good wind speed. You know, and everybody wants to talk about Mirage and yeah, Mirage can give us speed and direction, but even when we're looking at Mirage, we're really trying to translate that into a speed mm -hmm. because the speed is what we need to input into either the app or into the laser rangefinder, you know, which gives us our wind hold. Yeah. You know, so learning to think of wind in miles per hour, you know, that's, that's huge. And backing up a little bit is you talk about having uh, an app or some type of ballistic calculator is big. Yeah. It's, it's not just, can I get the wind speed right? It's then it becomes a formula that's mathematical that tells you what to hold. Yeah. So you're not just guessing like, oh, I should put this you know a little further in front or oh, i think that looks like two minutes of wind no you you know the mile an hour you put it in and you get a, a actual measured number yeah and so i think using a getting used to and learning a ballistic calculator and you can learn a ton from yep. the ballistic calculator as well and learn how much your bullet would drift at a certain distance and you know whether do i even need to hold wind when there's this little of wind and i'm this close or when do i need to you know yep. And then also the ballistic calculators are going to, you know, add in, if if they're advanced enough, they're going to add in spin drift, yep. Coriolis, which we know doesn't come into play till way late, but some of that, and then uh, arrow jump. Yep. And um, I think those are huge. A lot of guys will write down a dope card and then they'll look up what their hold is for five mile an hour wind and they'll write down those next to their dopes and that works but out to a certain distance and then all of a sudden there's other factors like spin drift and arrow jump that are coming into play that and, you know on wind drift too i think the big thing that people miss is air density mm -hmm. you know so if they build that range card you know at home at a thousand feet you know and they got okay with well, a 10 mile per hour wind i've got this much drift at say 600 yards then they go up to 10,000 feet well there's gonna be 30 percent less wind drift up there because the air is 30 percent thinner mm -hmm. you know and so I was probably one of the last ones to give up like our rules of thumb. You remember we had like our wind formulas in the Marine Corps and stuff that you yep. used. Yeah. You know, but that was the that was the problem with those is that they were pretty true at sea level where we spent a lot of our time training. Yeah, you know, but as soon as you got up in the mountains, that thinner air, that formulas, they didn't really work anymore. Right. You know, so I really think with today's technology, we're way better off using the technology than we are trying to use some sort of a formula we learned somewhere in our head, you know, that works in one environmental but it's got an air out of a different environmental. Yep. And then, like Jeremy said, then you got to trust it once you've verified. Oh, yeah. Trust. Yeah, I think, I I mean, I, we've taught rule of thumbs for since day one, right, in in LRU. Um, I, I, the problem I see with them is is we start using them, and then in a situation where we shouldn't be, we do. And so I really, oh, I'm kind of like Brian. Yep, I'm kind of like Brian. I'm just like, I gave up my rules of thumb. I, w I want that actual input not just the rule of thumb, because I, I find myself, oh, okay, I'm right on the edge of where the rule of thumb works. Uh, it'll probably work. Yeah. And I just do it. And then, man, dang, you know, I you know I missed this way or that way or whatever. It, it, when if I had just, you know, got my wind meter out or whatever and, and got an actual correction, I would have I been 
perfect. So I, I, I try to push like our students and stuff. Yep. We're going to give you some rule of thumb, you know, world comes to an end and I lose my batteries and my device doesn't work. Here's w worst case scenario. You can solve that problem, right? To some degree. But then I just push them really hard to every time we're going to get a direction, we're going to get a speed and we're going to input it and we're going to get an actual value. And then we're going to hold that value. And I guarantee nine out of 10 times, it's going to hit where you want it to hit, right? Yeah. Trust, trust that device, trust your, you know, trust the math, right? That's what it is. Just trust the math. You know, and I think where a lot of people miss it is they'll go out to the range and they practice shooting, you know, but then they forget about the other half of that equation, which is that ballistic laser range finder, which is giving them that wind solution. You know, and boy, if you don't practice inputting wind and knowing which buttons you need to push, you know, under a little bit of stress and under a little bit of time pressure, you're probably not going to get it done correctly in the field. Right. You know, so that's the other side of practice and it's just practice and putting that wind into the laser range finder. Yeah. You know, just make sure you're really familiar with that piece of equipment because that piece of equipment, once you start shooting distance, that piece of equipment is just as important as your rifle on making a shot. Yeah, for sure. That's, that's part of, again, equipment management, not only where is it located and how to get to it, but then yeah. how to, how, how to it. click the right buttons in, yeah. in, in timely, yeah, timely fashion. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll say that I've shot a couple animals in the 800, a couple animals in the seven, a couple animals in the six. I mean, all, all of us have, but my point is I, every one of those, I used a wind meter yeah. and a range finder and inputted the wind to exactly what it was doing at the, at where I was with the wind meter and what I thought it was doing in between us and at the target, et cetera. But I missed one last year at 520, 530 yards, something like that. And it was because I actually did do the input, but I didn't trust it. Yeah. And I like thought, nah, said. there's no way, yeah, there's no way it's that much. And then what I do, I missed the exact amount that I, you know, and I had it on scope cam. So I got to review it and look at it and be like, if I would have just done what the technology told yeah. me. Yeah. So, yeah. So get to know your equipment for sure. Um, any, any, uh, last suggestions on, and, and training stuff as we kind of wrap this up. Yeah, I kind of think the you got to look at everything you do in practice and training, and you got to look at it from the perspective of what we call training scars. You know, is there something that I'm doing just out of convenience that's going to translate into a negative in the field? You know, and I think like one of the biggest examples we see is like our our reloaders. They like to pluck every casing out of the shell or out of the chamber and set it back in their box so that brass doesn't hit the ground. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, but if you look at that, that's a that's a training scar that can translate into how you run that rifle in the field. Mm -hmm. You know, so just look at everything you do. You know, like, um, you know, when I was talking about doing tripod shooting, you know, I was talking about you get set up and you shoot two shots. Well, why two shots? Because I want you to get the practice of running that bolt, getting on and firing a quick follow-up shot. You know, so it's never a one-shot drill. There are always two-shot drills. Sure. So you get that, that follow-on practice, and I would take it even one step further. You know, is you shoot two rounds... But should you stop after you shoot two rounds uh, or should you cycle a third round and get back on target and decide and just decide, well, I'm not going to shoot again. Right. You know, because in that, that last example, you're actually doing it correctly. But if you just shoot two and stop, you're creating a training scar, which could lead you in the field to not chambering another round, then realizing you need another round and it's not there. Absolutely. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. So just watch out for training scars. Yeah. Okay. Jeremy? Uh, you know, I think for just, you know, for me, summation, just a 22 trainer, go on bad days, not, not nice days and just volume. If there's no lead in the air. There's no hope for learning. So <laughs> train by volume, yeah. like just, just get rounds downrange. You'll learn so much by, by just seeing the rounds impact downrange wherever, wh at whatever distance. Although you'll probably never catch up with Jeremy. How many how many <laughs> rounds did you have your last year in production? Well, when I was in production, I think the last year was 67,500 5, rounds that year, you know, yeah. proofing out everybody's firearm. Yeah. You know, on, on the so. same token, though, they say to, you know, they say to create like a muscle memory. In other words, to do something without having to think about it where your body just naturally does it correctly without you having to give a conscious thought. Mm -hmm. They say that takes about 3,000 repetitions. Mm -hmm. You know, so just think about, do you think the average person ever gets 3,000 repetitions on a trigger press? No. Probably not. Not even close. Yeah, not even close. You know, so, which means that they're still having to think about it. It's not just happening correctly. Mm -hmm. You know, so to Jeremy's point, you know, volume in the training, you know, but just make sure you're doing it perfectly mm -hmm. because if you're not doing it correctly, then you're just learning bad habit. Sure. 
I think my my last tidbit would just be the whole, like Brian was talking about, the tape in yourself, setting your phone up and and recording and just watching because consistency is accuracy and you'll notice that you're, you think you're doing stuff right, but then you videotape yourself and you're like, okay, I, I put my thumb in a different spot every time. I take my face off the gun between shots, you know, right. things like that. So, okay, well, is there, uh, what else, anything else that, uh, any other suggestions? Yeah, I just think you can't underestimate the value of formal training. You know, I've been kind of fortunate, you know, I can't count the number of miscellaneous, you know, you know, sniper schools I've been to, you know, and you'd think coming out of like the Marine Corps sniper program, you know, you'd be like, well, I've been to the, the graduate course, you know, why am I going to go to these basic courses? You know, but two things, number one, I'm going to learn something. Yeah. You're going to, it's a different person. They're going to say something in such a way that it clicks with you. You're going to learn a new technique. And then number two, worst case scenario, you spend a week shooting, you spend a few days shooting, you get better at your fundamentals. You know, so just because you've been to a school once, you know, I would really recommend go to some sort of formal training, you know, whether it's ours or somebody else's, and then whatever class you haven't been to, the next year go to the one you didn't do, go to. Sure. Yeah. You know, get that formal training because it, it puts pressure on you. You're being taught by a different person, and it's just a completely different environment than when you're just on your home range, your, your home range just shooting. Yeah, and you're getting out of your comfort zone again. Yeah. It's it's not your, it's controlled, but it's not your controlled. It's controlled by somebody else. So you're exactly. Gonna, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Well, thanks, Brian. Uh, Jeremy, thank you. Any Anything last from you? Nope, I'm good, man. Okay. All right. Thanks for uh, listening in, guys. Uh, tune in next time. If you like what you're hearing here, please take a second and give us a five-star rating and a positive review on iTunes or on your favorite podcast app. We appreciate your feedback and suggestions for topics you'd like discussed or questions you want answered on the podcast. You can reach out on Facebook or Instagram or send us an email to podcast at gunworks.com. Also, be sure and check out our full offering of long-range gear at gunworks.com. Use promo code LRP for free shipping on any order.